Today on Beers TV, we're talking ULM fish, feeding them, and cleanup crews, and then giving away a $200 food package at the end. I'm Ryan, your host of Beers TV Tank Trials ULM Edition. This is episode 15 of ULM and development of an ultra low maintenance system. The goal is a stable, show caliber reef tank, which requires as little maintenance as possible, potentially performing only a few minutes of maintenance a month. Today we're gonna to talk ultra low maintenance fish, feeding them and cleanup crews. I think one of the things we're gonna hit on right away is this probably isn't gonna be everyone's favorite episode because I don't think that low maintenance is really the main goal when selecting livestock. Most reefers are often looking for a color, behavior, shape, or something else and thinking about care or maintenance as a distant second. In the case of this ULM series, low maintenance and limiting the requirement for many tasks is obviously the number one goal. So we're going to look at that from this position. And there's a legit opportunity here to select livestock that either doesn't add much additional work or even actually removes work. So starting with fish selection, if you want a low maintenance tank, it makes sense to not select fish that require special nutritional diets or procedures. For example, hand feeding a dwarf lion or dwarf eel, multiple feedings a day for active fish like antheus or chromis, algae clips for algae lovers like tangs, small particulate foods in the sand for sand sifters, very healthy pod populations for mandarins, careful feeding procedure for training finicky eaters like copper bands, seahorses, or pipefish. Well, none of this is particularly hard. What they eat, how frequently they need it, and any difficulties related to that are absolutely something to consider before selecting a fish for a ULM tank. For instance, one of the staples of success behind the BRS Clown Harem tank is overfeeding the tank and almost eliminating food aggression altogether. We've been successful with this for many years now because we're willing to dump food into the tank at regular intervals, both many times a day as well as on the weekend when no one's here using an automatic feeder. However, the flip side of that is also we're willing to do sizable weekly water changes to manage that nutrient input. If we stop that, the tank would be riddled with algae and ultra high nutrients. Now they could be automated and there are other nutrient solutions, but the point is the same. By selecting a harem tank, we needed to commit to long term solutions and the maintenance or work related to that. After approaching 15 years of reefing, while I am willing to do almost anything for a reasonable period, I now ask myself, am I willing to perform that procedure every day for many years to come? The answer more often than not isn't that I don't want to, I just don't have the time and I'm often away from the tank often enough that it isn't realistic or feasible. For instance, my tanks in my office, I'm not just away on the weekends, but also holidays and vacations. I just shouldn't have any fish in them that have specialized dietary needs if I actually want to care for my pets. So in that spirit, let's talk about what makes a low maintenance fish. This really isn't an exciting list because there's a reason why they're the most common and widely available. It's often because they do well in aquariums. Clownfish are at the top of the list, take Fang and Sir Chomps a lot, who've been with us for like seven years, starting in our first How to Start a Saltwater Tank series. A half dozen tanks since then, now breeding in the 160. A pair of clownfish seem to do well in a vast majority of reef tanks. Same thing with common yellow and purple tangs. Hardy and do well in most tanks. Flame or longnose hawkfish, most blennies, orchid dottybacks, cardinal fish, and most shrimp gobies. That's a pretty easy list to put together and I think it's actually more valuable to talk about what makes a fish higher maintenance. There are some smaller tasks like putting a screen on the top for the tank because there are jumpers in many tanks. Well that's a pretty minimal task. I think a lot of reefers just don't want to have to take a screen off the top of the tank every time they feed or put their hands in the tank, particularly on big tanks. But most of the maintenance is related to nutritional requirements in feeding. For instance, tangs do better when there's a source of algae often done with seaweed clips and nori. Very active fish like chromis and antheas who burn a lot of calories do best with frequent feedings, often many times a day and likely benefit from foods more similar to their natural diet with small plankton type foods like cyclopods and calanus versus large meaty foods. It's pretty common for many chromis and antheas to slowly die off over time if their nutritional needs are not met on a constant basis. Dwarf mores often need to be hand fed, dwarf lions often need some help finding their food, neither will often eat prepared dried foods. Chad here was successful training his copper band to eat frozen by freezing food onto a coral skeleton for him to pick off of. Sand sifters often do better when you turn off all the pumps and put small particulate foods on the surface of the sand. The marginally reef safe fish like some angels and butterflies have a much higher chance of being reef safe if you add them before you add corals and feed them heavily. If they're not hungry, they're way less likely to go after corals and inverts. 
Seahorses and pipefish do better in a predominantly species-only tank where you're willing to hand feed them every day and in many cases grow them live foods. Similar to that, mandarins do best and even thrive not when you can train them to eat unnatural foods, but when you put in some effort to provide their evolutionary natural diet of copepods. In fact, if you put some effort up front, some fish like mandarins, which are often referred to as one of the hardest fish to maintain, can actually be the easiest. With a proper refugium structure that supports a healthy pod population and time to build a sustainable population, the mandarin may be the only fish in the tank which doesn't actually need to be fed anything directly and survives solely off the other elements of maintaining a healthy reef tank. I think the same thing can be said as sand sifters. Provided a large enough tank and time for the sand to populate properly, there's a much better chance of maintaining a sustainable population or at least time to transition the fish to eating prepared foods they stumble upon. I just haven't seen many reefers who really are willing to turn off all the pumps and incorporate small particulate foods into the sand for long periods of time. A year or two is common, but five is less so. So from a ULM perspective, the options are obviously smaller, but I suspect that a lot of reefers may be willing to let this element of their ULMs go because feeding your fish is one of the few ways you really get to interact with them and worth it. That said, it's worth taking a moment to be honest with ourselves about the time, frequency, consistency, and general effort that we can put into feeding before we select the fish for a ULM, which will not only make us more successful, but also what's best for our pets. So in relation to all this, it's a good time to talk about fish food in general. I'm just gonna be real, I think anyone that says that they know what the exact best food is, is almost certainly basing that on some personal experiences tied to some personal beliefs, rather than generally agreed upon science and biology. I say that because I think that's true for every pet industry. No one has universally agreed upon the perfect dog, cat, or fish food. Just kind of a mentality in seeing what works best for your pets. So in that spirit, I think you can group almost every pet food out there into three general categories. And I think it's helpful or easier to consider pet food as a whole rather than just fish food because the approaches for various pets are very similar. I think a lot of pet owners and industry thought leaders will agree many of the best approaches to pet food is based on matching the diet to an evolutionary prey that they feed on, which often comes frozen. The next best approach is being a more prepared food, which is often in cans or dry pellets, but contains ingredients based on an evolutionary diet and avoids fillers or cheap ingredients. And the third type of food is just whatever is cheapest with the cheapest ingredients, but I don't think there's a lot of value in exploring that one. So looking at foods that attempt to mimic the evolutionary natural diet with dogs and cats, that's often frozen or raw cooked prey animals like chickens, rabbit, or pheasant, often just ground up whole and then frozen. Same thing for fish foods with various types of shrimp, krill, clams, and squid meat, or for smaller fish who typically feed on smaller, more platonic type foods, there are options like cyclopods and peas, calanus, which is much closer to their evolutionary diet than say a whole chunk of shrimp or squid. Within that, there are also blends like Rod's Food, which is a frozen blend of whole shrimp, whole squid, whole oyster, whole clams, whole octopus, perch, scallop, krill, Pacific plankton, brine shrimp, fish eggs, green seaweed, certified raw red seaweed, all kinds of things. I think that most reefers feel that these frozen foods based on evolutionary prey with some attention to the actual fish in the tank and what they've eaten for a millennia is probably at least one of the better options and they're almost always more palatable to the fish which means that they're more likely to eat them and receive proper nutrition. That said, frozen foods do require some additional effort. First, you need to do it manually every day or in some cases multiple times a day. Having to do this once or multiple times a day really isn't ULM or ultra low maintenance. But at the same time, it's not that it's a lot of work. It just means you need to be physically present and able to do it. Feeding is one of the more enjoyable components of maintenance, so it might not be considered maintenance at all for many reefers. That said, to get the palatability and nutritional benefits, it's always wise to buy it from somewhere that has a proper cooling solution and the food hasn't been allowed to thaw over and over. Almost all the benefits of frozen are lost if it's allowed to repeatedly thaw. The little cubes thaw pretty quick, so it's worth the effort to drive to a store with a solid freezer where the food is clearly cared for with little frost or freezer burn. If you live a ways away, it's also a decent idea to bring a cooler with some ice to get it home.
Similar to the actual fish themselves, food is something that's often better bought in person at the fish store where you can see how it's cared for. But if you do buy it online, it's certainly wise to have it overnighted to a location where you can put it in the freezer right away when it arrives. Letting it sit on the porch all day in 100 degree weather is probably not a good idea. Moving on to prepared foods. For dogs and cats, prepared foods is either in cans or served in a bag of dry pellets. The better option is either making a serious attempt at eliminating or at least limiting the non-evolutionary foods like corn and grains. Those that do intentionally include these things at least provide their own science-based claims as to how they've improved on nature. Same thing with fish foods. Some foods are offered and preserved whole in jars like the Nios planktons or dock eco eggs or even freeze dried in cans like those from Hakari but most prepared foods come in a dried pellet form. I won't make any claims as to who makes the best because there's no way to really know that. I can just say I personally look for three things starting with an ingredient list based predominantly on marine based organisms. They all seem to have some other elements like brewer's yeast and wheat or cornstarch so there doesn't seem to be a way around that but the more marine based organisms the better. I also look for the highest fat and protein levels. I think a couple of the best in that department are the Kari Marine Carnivore Diet, which is 47% protein and 12% fat, and the Neptune Crossover Diet, which is 46% protein and 16% fat. The fat in particular here is much higher than other options and approaching double the energy content of many foods. For those fish which are evolutionary algae eaters, a lot of reefers feed dry nori sheets. However, if you don't like putting your hands in the tank, Hakari Seaweed Extreme is 67% seaweed and an excellent alternative. Or a blended option with Hakari's herbal diet which has the first two ingredients of fish meal and dried seaweed. The last thing I'd look at is the packaging because it's the packaging that's protecting the food from moisture and oxygen which can degrade the quality of the food pretty rapidly. So I guess I'd find something that's capable of sealing well. I will say the foil lined bags tend to have some of the best moisture and gas protection properties of any of the packaging options out there. So here's the thing about pellets and dried foods. I think a lot of people will come to the conclusion that they're a much lower maintenance option, particularly because you don't need to be concerned about keeping them frozen and thawing them, meaning that they can be kept right at the tank, which is easier all around. But the real ULM component here is you can use the automatic feeders, meaning I know the fish are getting consistent nutrition. I don't forget here at the office, it still happens on weekends and holidays and when I'm on vacation. Something that's super difficult to make happen if I feed exclusively frozen. There's really no question, auto feeders and pellets are a much lower maintenance option than frozen foods and algae based pellets are solid alternatives to the work of daily addition of nori to the clip. I absolutely feel like the right selection of frozen foods has the potential to be a much better choice from a nutritional and palatability standpoint, but as long as you're selecting a high quality pellet food, I don't think it's fair to consider them any worse than any other type of high quality pellet pet food like those for dogs and cats. Fact is, only a small percentage of pet owners across the board are feeding frozen evolutionary prey type diets. One last note on this, with many popular auto feeders, it can be difficult to mix food. Like say I wanted to use Neptune's crossover diet and Hikari Seaweed Extreme. The reality is one of the pellets is smaller than the other, so the feeder will almost always feed most of the smallest pellets first, even if the difference is subtle. So don't be surprised if it ends up feeding a lot more of the smaller pellets first. Okay, moving on to the cleanup crew being mostly inverts, crabs, snails, and other critters. I have to say, I think a lot of them are awesome, but a ton are also overplayed. I guess I just use some common sense and watch their behavior to make up your own mind on which provide the most value. This is just based on my own and the team's experience here, but there are always some exceptions, so don't be surprised if your experience is somewhat different in your unique instance. I'll start with fish because I think that they're probably one of the most effective against algae and predators. Yellow and purple tanks are probably my number one on my list and I don't think I'd set up a tank with that one. Even these 60 gallon cubes which most will say are too small, they're just a, such an effective tool against algae. I'm willing to buy them small and when they outgrow the tank, either give them to a friend, add them to a larger tank or trade them into the store for smaller ones. It will likely take you years to outgrow them in the tank. In the meantime, all they do all day is hunt down algae everywhere in the display. Really just an awesome addition to any tank looking to reduce the maintenance or cleaning of the tank. Not quite as effective, but I think Tailspot and Lawnmower Blennies are also good examples of algae eating fish who are at work a vast majority of the day eating algae. Tailspots being a bit cooler looking in some ways. If you have an established sand bed, I also say that sand sifters can be really solid additions which will help keep your sand clean, but I'll also say very often don't last a long time and have a high rate of mortality. 
If you have to target feed them, it not only adds unwanted nutrients to your tank, but also more work that a lot of people only do for a short period of time. So on the fence here, they can be very effective at cleaning the sand, but often not the best option. If you have pests in the tank or don't quarantine your corals, I think wrasses like the six line or yellow chorus wrasse or similar are always on the hunt. All day long looking for critters to eat off the corals and rock work. We mentioned a while back that the BRS-160 had a real issue with Monty eating nudies. We added a six line and problem solved. I'm sure they're still in there somewhere, but the six line does an awesome job of making them a non-issue and eliminating any work associated with attempting to manage the nudies or remove them. Related to that, copper bands and some tilefish can be solid Aptasia eaters, copper bands not being the hardiest of fish, and tilefish sometimes going after corals, so be aware. With copper bands in particular, just don't buy one and hope for the best. Do your fish a favor and read up on the best ways to get them eating to increase your rate of success. In relation to inverts, a lot of reefers will buy tank cleaner packages with 100 or even 300 crabs and snails. In most cases, a vast majority will die because there isn't enough food for all of them, so they starve to death and just up adding unwanted nutrients to the tank. I just don't think this is the most effective way to approach cleaning your tank, particularly on a new tank which has very limited algae. Opinions will vary on this, but I also just don't find small hermits to be particularly effective at any goal other than being cool to look at and potentially breaking down some detritus. The only real crab I have for purposes of cleanup crew is the emerald crabs. They not only go after some of the algaes others don't, like bubble algae, but they again are very obviously cleaning the tank all day long and you can see where they've been because that area of the tank is clean. Of the snail options out there, there's one that really stands out for our team and that's a trochus, which will not only seem to eat the widest variety of algae, it aggressively cleans rock surfaces and in most cases also capable of flipping themselves over when they fall off the glass or rock. You can also consider larger turbo snails, but depending on where they're collected, they very often don't have long lives in the aquarium, can become nutrient bombs, and often push corals around. I know some people buy snails to keep the glass clean, but in most cases, the tiny trail of mouth marks often just make the tank look dirtier than a thin film of algae. Almost like vacuuming a line through the middle of your room, I didn't realize how dirty it was until I can see the clean stripe. Most urchins are also awesome algae eaters and will clean a rock almost overnight. Just note that they can push corals around and they'll eat coralline algae, so some people find that undesirable. There are some more aggressive options like sea hares, but note once they run out of food, they often die and can become a nutrient bomb in the tank as well. Clams or even oysters are one option that a lot of reefers use to clean the actual water itself and potentially a natural alternative to activated carbon, other filtration media, or potentially even a nutrient reduction option. I think one that most reefers completely overlook is a nearly invisible cleanup crew, which is really the foundation, and that's a healthy pod population, which is clearing the algae at its very beginnings before you would ever even see it. A solid refugium has a potential to be beneficial much further than just a nutrient reduction solution. Honestly, there's no end to the list of stars and various critters which can add diversity to the tank, and some will absolutely play a major role in cleaning the tank, but I'd pay close attention to their actual behavior to decide for yourself if they are just more fun additions to the tank than they are maintenance reducers. So what do the community think about ULM Livestock? Starting on YouTube, Emmanuel Lopez, clownfish, because it's a reef tank. They also adapted so well to aquariums, they can live long and reproduce in tanks. I think that's a good point. Reproductive habits are an excellent sign that a fish isn't just surviving, but thriving. Engineering aquariums, I'd go with a Sally Lightfoot crab and emerald crab. A few hermits and a few snails, astria and turbo. Fish-wise, plant eaters are gonna be more ULM than say antheas, but number is gonna be more important than type. I agree that any fish eating algae all day long is not just low maintenance, but often negative maintenance and more than carrying its own weight. Over on Reef to Reef TJM 23 SLO, cleanup crew, trochus snails and Sarah snails, the Sarah's population will expand and contract as needed. If you end up with a sand bed, then the Sarah snails, no sand, then maybe Astria snails, maybe some peppermint shrimp, pods for the refugium, and I like emerald crabs as a pet and scavenger and haven't seen any coral damage yet. No hermits unless they're in the refugium, made the mistake, and now waiting them out. I totally agree on the hermits, but I bet a debate will be started here. DS04384, best cleanup crew for a ULM tank has to include trochus snails since they can flip over more efficiently than other snails, and you don't have to watch closely and make sure there aren't on their back. 
Also, they can sometimes reproduce in a tank so they could potentially become a self-sustaining cleanup crew, although that might not work in a smaller volume tank. Trochus snails absolutely can breed and reproduce in the tank and is a solid benefit. PVH Reef spelled it out perfect. Thinking of good fish choices for a ULM tank, I think of the following factors. Hardy, not disease prone, easy to feed, can thrive on dry food from an auto feeder and probably doesn't need more than two feedings a day. Peaceful, won't harm other fish with close relatives excluded. Reliably reef safe, taking an angelfish that decides to eat coral or hawkfish that eats your shrimp out of a tank isn't very ULM. Doesn't get too big, helps the tank be even more ULM by eating pests. So I think that one post about sums it all up. So what are we gonna do with the three ULMs? Well, right now all three have a purple tang and a tail spot blenny, and we're gonna do something kind of fun. So we moved over three pairs of our snowflake clowns from the BRS clown harem tank into the three cubes. These clowns are super healthy, some are pretty large, and I'm very certain that they're gonna start breeding within months as long as the environment is stable. Outside of that, while I'm sure it would be more fun to just dump fish in and fill it up, we're gonna go about it a bit slower. There really isn't much to keep clean right now, so it might be a while before we add more fish, but I want to add them with purpose and make sure they do fit the needs of an office tank, which absolutely needs to be more ULM or lower maintenance than a home tank. For that reason, I'll absolutely be feeding dried pellets and selecting fish that will do well with that choice. In this case, it'll be Neptune's crossover diet because of the high protein and fat content, and we use an auto feeder so we know that they're fed on time every day regardless of what life or work demands on me. Because I do like interacting with the tank, I'm gonna hand feed some Hakari Seaweed Extreme for the tanks, but it's not a big deal if this isn't done every single day. For the auto feeder right now, we're using the battery operated in Telefeed just because it's lower cost, but the AFS from Neptune does have some advantages like being powered over the Aquabus cable so there are no batteries to change. And it works with the Apex feed modes which can turn off various pumps or any other equipment to reduce any food that might otherwise go down the overflow. Overall, this design just seems to be the easiest to install and works the best at measuring most foods. In terms of crabs and snails, I'm just not going to add many until there's actual signs of algae in the tank, which will likely come when we get the corals and the lights are turned up. I want to make sure that there's a legit food source for them, but as we add livestock, each week we'll share what we added and why. Don't forget, we're giving away that $200 food package, so hit that link in the lower left to sign up or head on over to the site, hit the specials and deals tab, then free stuff. Next week, I haven't decided if we're gonna start adding corals to these tanks or if we're gonna share the beginnings of the next Beerus TV experiment. So motivate me one way or the other in the comments or reef to reef thread. See you next week with another episode of Beerus TV.